Okay. Uh, Got it. Okay. Now, are we live? Live. Yep. Yeah, we are. We are live. live. Okay. Well, I, you know, I was just saying. Uh, well, you all know that I, I'm Bev Scott, founder for uh, introducing youth to American Infrastructure Inc. Aya, and it is absolutely a pleasure and a real honor to be able to, uh, for us at this lunch and learn today. I want to be real clear. You're going to hear me saying, um, Miss Laverta Allen. Okay. Uh, who is our guest speaker for today. Um, and, and I'm just going to be honest with you. And I'm going to be saying Miss Laverta Allen, and you're going to be hearing mother. Okay. And I have to say that I am so honored. Um, my mother called her mother. Okay. And so she has been a, uh, a trusted mentor, um, just unbelievable uh, person and, and just uh, professional and just everything that you could possibly ask for, for me, as well as so many other people in this industry. Okay. I could not think of a, uh, a better person to actually close out this portion of our Lunch and Learn series. We place a lot of emphasis on trying to bring the very best that we can in terms of professionals in the industry and people who have uh, really, really have a true belief of, of trying to do the very best that they can for people and communities. So um, the, and we're really delighted that everybody's been able, uh, been able to join. Uh, the, uh, Ms. Uh, Allen is, there are just no words to describe her. She's been uh, on the line in terms of, of civic activism and leadership and courage uh, just as a lifetime of that, but very, very focused in terms of always what could you wind up doing to uplift uh, people in communities, particularly people of color, um, people who have been un underrepresented, vulnerable communities. Uh, she is uh, absolutely an icon in the infrastructure sector. Uh, the Allen Group, and I'm not going to take much longer, the Allen Group is uh, absolutely a striking example of what is possible, okay, when, uh, what is possible in terms of what you can achieve when you believe it and you stand, uh, you stand on quality, professionalism, and uh, also on a whole lot of courage and values. Uh, they are a leading uh, firm in the Bay Area. Uh, African uh, uh, African American uh, third generation. Uh, uh, the president of the firm, Miss Allen, is the chair of the uh, board of directors of the Allen Group. But uh, her daughter, who is a, a striking professional in and of her own, uh, is uh, Shotzi Jefferson, is the uh, president of the Allen Group and has continued uh, uh, what has been a tremendous. Uh, legacy of community service and entrepreneurism. So what I'm going to do right now, they walk what they talk. And that's one of the reasons I felt that this was so important. We would get the, the perspective of having been on the front line for decades. We would get the perspective of a company and a, a person, a leader who walks what they talk. And so at this point, I am going to turn it over. My daddy used to say, I can show you better than I can tell you to Justin. Uh, Justin is has been with the uh, Allen Group for the better part of eight. I remember when he was really a baby. Okay, of eight plus years, he is a uh, a project a project manager uh, with significant responsibilities at a major billion dollar project that the Allen uh, Group has at San Francisco International Airport. The other thing I want to note is that they do not only do work in the Bay Area, but are one of a handful a project uh, of PMOs, as we call them, uh, with the Federal Transit Administration, where they have had the responsibility for managing and over for oversight, let's put it that way, and compliance review for uh, projects across the country uh, and projects totaling over $5 billion. So uh, with that, uh, Justin, I'm going to turn it over to you, uh, the, uh, what we call one of the, the younger professionals uh, at the Allen Group, and uh, I take it to you to, for the rest of the program. Hey. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Scott. Um, quick question. Are we fading in and out? 
you're fading in and out. We're we're still looking like Star Trek right now. Okay. And so, and so Miss Laverta is is beam on Scotty. <laughs> yeah, you might want to get a little bit closer to the camera. I think that'll help detect you guys more if it's possible to get closer. Yeah. Um yeah, Justin, we see you there. That's it. You, you came in crisply. Yeah. Okay, you came right. in crisply. That's it. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. So we are with Mother Laverna Allen. We call her Mother because she's like a mother to us all. She's not afraid to speak her mind and tell us how she feels about things. But she's going to share with us today some more insight as Dr. Scott told us about uh, herself, her legacy, how she came to. And I found this picture. So I do, I'm not sure if you saw this picture yet. But, uh, you know, this is Miss Allen uh, back in the day and up till now. Um, such a beautiful woman inside and out and um, she's going to speak to and we're going to ask her some questions about how, how she came to be all these great accomplishments that she's achieved over the years and as Dr. Scott also mentioned you know a legacy of three generations with the Allen Group as you can see here from this photo herself uh, president of the company now Shotzi and her daughter Bianca so I was already introduced, so we're just going to kind of jump into this conversation with Miss A. Miss A, Mama A, Mama Allie. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. As long as you're ready, I'm ready. I need to see you got a lot of notes. I got, I got a few notes here. Look, we're going to try to combat it to 30 minutes or so, but, you know, you know how we do with time. So, yeah. you know, we celebrated your 91st birthday not too long ago. Um, you had a long life of service, of courage, a true trailblazer in this industry. However, how did you get started? Tell us from your roots. Now, I know you're from Mississippi, <laughs> and you, you came from Mississippi, born and raised. And tell us how it was then and how you migrated out here to California. Well, good. I got to California because of the war, and my father was brought here. But I guess we need to talk more about how did I get in the construction management business, which was very few uh, African-Americans and even fewer women involved in that whole business at that time. And that was fear by sheer accident. I just decided I could do better in helping uh, people of color get projects and some of the major infrastructure projects that were going on in California than what the current management were doing. So mm -hmm. they decided to take me up on my challenge, and I ended up being successful. Okay, okay. So how about how about your roots? Because I mean, I'm 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 pretty sure you're grounded by your parents. Were were they hard on you back in the day, like while, while you were growing up as a youngster? Because I know you you mentioned you lived on a farm as well. Was it hard work back then? Is that what kind of grounded you into your well, way? I, have, I didn't have any hard work to do. You know, we were the chosen ones staying with my grandparents and my parents. And we were so far in the woods, you didn't have any choice but to study. There was nothing else really to do. So uh, farm life was great for us. We were on 200 acres of land and okay. did whatever we wanted to do. Okay. So then you came out here to California. Now, I heard you were- really I went to lots of places before we got to California. Like where? Oh, we were in Georgia, uh, outside of Savannah, Georgia, on a little island out there called Thunderbolt. Mm -hmm. uh, from there, we went to Pasco, Washington, where my father helped build the Hanford Atomic Energy Plant. From there to New Jersey, and we ended up staying in New York. And I did my initial high school work in New York. And then from New York, we came to California. Oh, I did. And we ended up staying in California simply because the war was over. World War II was over in 1944. And we were in California, and so we just stayed. I, I remember those years. Yeah. And the history was. I know you remember those years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. So then you came out here and then um 
I know you graduated high school early, age of 16. Yeah, I finished high school at Tech High in Oakland, 1948, went to Cal and then transferred from Cal and went to San Francisco State College. Got a degree in social work from San Francisco State College and a master's in education administration from San Francisco State College and University. Very well educated. Okay, so then after college education, um, explain your tra transition into, into the industry. Uh, what, what did you do first after college? Even though I think- you Well, I was a school teacher right? for a while. Yes, I taught uh, both uh, elementary and uh, high school. And then from there, I went as an administrator to the local community college. That's right, that's right. And then from the community college, I started my own business. We started doing educational consulting at first. And from that, uh, I convinced somebody I knew a little bit about concrete and steel and what have you. So I ended up dealing in construction and trying to uh, make sure that uh, we had minority workers. So I started off in terms of working with labor unions and opening up opportunities for minorities in the apprenticeship program. Because of the community college where I was, we had all of the major apprentice programs at that college. Mm -hmm. was, was this your first business? Oh, no, the Allen Group is not my first business. I had two businesses before that. Uh, I had a consulting firm that did mostly educational consulting firm for about 22 years. And then, of course, we had a wholesale retail beauty supply business for something like about 40. And was it the beauty supply business that came first, I believe? Uh, the beauty supply business was first. And then from that, and my husband ran the beauty supply business. I was really just the agitator. And so I, I wasn't too much involved in that. I was the agitator to make sure that the hair care industry would sell to uh, minority uh, owned wholesale retail beauty supply houses, just like they did to everybody else. You see. When we first opened up the beauty supply house, you know, most of the major manufacturers that provided things that the African-American beauticians wanted to use would only sell to white uh, distributors and we would have to go and buy from them rather than buying direct. And of course, I decided that wasn't quite fair. And so I went to a big conference and told the people at some of the distributors, uh, we won't buy your stuff anymore if you don't sell to us. I like that a lot, I'm sure. How did they take that? They were very upset, want to know who I was. And I said, well, try me. Yeah, because now. So <laughs> I said, try me. I guess they asked around and said, well, maybe you really don't want to try her. So. Because this is back during, you know, 1960s. It's back right? in the mid 50s, yeah. Okay, mid 50s and 60s, because, you know, it wasn't easy for. African American, especially a, a black woman own owner to um to really do the things that you're gonna go up to the certain go up to the people and speak your mind and have your way. I mean, what, what kind of lashback did you get from some people if you went and decided to speak your mind and your own Miss Allen way? Well, in terms of our customers, I got support. Mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't get a backlash from them. The only time I got a backlash from them was when I took on another issue. But at any rate, I got support from them. Uh, the white manufacturer thought I was totally crazy and wondered uh, where did I get the great idea that I was going to take them on. Uh, so I just decided I'd have to show them So. Uh, so when they got some of their orders were cut in half or not at all, and uh, that sort of got people pretending. What what kind of characteristics would you say described yourself during that time period or kept you motivated to continue to do what you're doing? 
Well, I always felt that uh, my people had to have a better share and a better opportunity than what they'd ever had before. And that somebody had to be a trailblazer. And I wasn't interested in the theatrics that go along with being with that. And I shied away from the newspaper and interviews and all of those things and just quietly went along my way in terms of trying to make a change. Okay, okay. So then we kind of um, fast forward through your two companies you started and we get to the Allen Group. Um, what what made you start up the Allen Group? There was a young man in San Francisco who called me and said, Laverta, I got a project that I'm having a lot of problems on. And I know you know something about construction and have done this, and I need you to come work on this project. I said, come work on that project. Oh, God, I don't want to do that. He said, <laughs> he said, no, I need you. He said, no, you're the only one I know that can sit and hold a candle with this contractor. And I need you to come and work on this project. So I said, well, okay. I had my, you know, my business license and everything. So I decided to take the project. And I'd like to say to you today, the engineer that worked for me on that project is working for me today. Ooh, okay. Years later. All right. And, uh, and of course, she was a female. I want you to know, Jessica. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She, she was working for another firm. And I said, Vanessa, I need you to come with me. And I said, it's going to be hard but you know I'm going to support you. She said, all right, Miss Allen, I'll give them the, my notice today. <laughs> she came with me and she's still with me. Oh, I love to hear that. And then, um, so the Allen Group has uh, a lot of projects within like the transit, transportation, infrastructure industry. Um, how did you break into that industry or start getting contracts with them? Well, uh, first of all, I started off uh, with projects where it was my responsibility to open up opportunities for other minority firms. And with that, I made a lot of friends, a lot of enemies, and changed a lot of the methods in which agencies made a decision and selected from them. And then finally, one day, somebody said, well, Alberta, we need this project going on today. Why don't you put together a team for it? And it really was sort of, the, that's the way I started in terms of the Allen Group becoming a consultant on major projects. Before I had started out just working in terms of providing opportunities for other uh, minority firms. And of course, I still do that. I try not to be very, try not to be selfish about that. It's still important that I maintain that role of helping others at any time that I can. And all of my staff, Justin, you know, I expect that from you and everybody else. I know. You get me stern talking to uh, quite often. Yes. But, you know, I'm not shutting out pretty well. <laughs> yeah. I'm pleased with you, babe. <laughs> You're like my child. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, let's see, because, you know, during these times, because, you know, I, I had to look at the history book a bit. Um, because, you know, like SFO, they really went through a big growth period after like the 1930s through the 50s. You know, back during that time, you know, flights were just picking up. Uh, BART wasn't around. Um you know, Uber and Lyft didn't exist. <laughs> so <laughs> I believe the main transportation routes was what through through bus and train. You know, so you you went through decades of uh, industry growth into where we are today. Um, how was it like working through those times and up to I guess current day? Well, I have to say, I had a wonderful time because everybody knew I was going to say what was on my mind. And so I did not end up having lots of problems that some people end up having. 
when I got our first major project at the Allen Group at the San Francisco airport uh, with a contractor, I didn't have any problem with either of him at all. When he discovered that I could read a contract like he could, uh, you know, we had a whole new relationship. And when he discovered he had to go hire him a local lawyer, because I wasn't going to pay $75 an hour for my lawyer to talk to his $18 an hour uh, construction technician. So he didn't have a local lawyer. So in order for him to deal with me, he had to go hire him a lawyer. Okay. For the personal. And you, um, until this day, still, you know, still doing work at the airport. So. Yes, I'm still doing work at the airport. In fact, uh, my chief engineer that I hired out there, that I to fight every day for him, <laughs> he's now second in command out there. So I guess I did for him. Yeah. You know, you also have me out there right now. So. Oh, yeah, I got yeah, you yeah. out there. Oh, oh. Uh, and they're taking good care of you, too, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. very well. Yeah. So for the viewers, we have some noticeable accomplishments. I'm just going to read some of them all because I know you accomplished a lot over your years with just some of them so that everyone looking up. So you uh, co-authored the country's first affirmative action program that called for minority participation by breath. Okay. Yeah. You served on the San Francisco Human Rights Advisory Committee. Yeah was instrumental in the passage of the San Francisco Minority and Women-Owned Business Ordinance in 1988. Yeah. And was a co-founder of the National Association of Minority Contractors. Yeah. Those are some big achievements. Well, we still have a long way to go. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, as people of color, we are always going to have somewhere to go and need something else to do. And I don't think we can rest on our laurels in our terms of what we did in the past. We need to be looking what we need to work on for the future and how we are going to go about trying to achieve those things. And I believe in taking incremental steps of small uh, uh, ideas on what can happen and work on accomplishing that. And then move on to the next step and know how and how you're going to implement that when you accomplish it. And hopefully you're going to be successful. I think you always <laughs> need to have a suitcase full of ideas so that you got somewhere to move the next time. And when that opportunity comes up, you can grab it and start working on it. Awesome. I like that. Um, let's see, picking on one accomplishment. Uh, let's see, you were, okay, so the San Francisco Human Rights Advisory Committee. Um, can you recall any personal stories or times, maybe even going into one of the meetings that you could share? Well, I don't remember any particular meeting that's been so long ago. But I can tell you one of the things we did do as an example uh, we set up with the Human Rights Commission in San Francisco that contractors had to pay their subcontractors through an instrument that could be immediately negotiated. Uh, what had happened before is you'd have a contractor that was a big national contractor, and he would have his major bank would be in New York. So he would get paid by, let's say, the San Francisco airport. Um, and his check would go to the bank in New York. And then, uh, according to the California <laughs> legislation, uh, the California requirement, he had to pay his subcontractor within 10 days after he got paid. So he would wait until that 10th day before he would give them their check. And then, of course, when they take it to their bank, their bank would wait until the check was cleared by the Bank of New York, which was another seven days. So that meant by the time the small minority contractor can use his money, the major contractor would have drawn interest on his money for 17 days. 
before he would get access to it. So we set up a thing when I was on the commission that they had to pay him within three days. And it had to be on a bank that was negotiable immediately. So that mm -hmm. meant they had to have a California bank right Thank there. For that mm -hmm. And of course, the interesting thing about that, my first contract with the San Francisco airport was the contract I worked with had exactly the program that I just told you about. And he ended up having to let me manage all the money because his company would not let him open up an account at a local bank in San Francisco. So I ended up managing all the money. <laughs> Boss. I guess such a kick uh, out of it. Right. Oh, man. So, so Ms. Al, speaking to your legacy um, and your long career journey, who has helped you along the way? I think everybody I've met have helped me along the way. And the most important thing has been my staff. Because had I not had good staff, it wouldn't have mattered how uh, many things I put in place or what I did, I would have never been where I am. Mm -hmm. I've just been very fortunate to hire young people and give them as much support as I could uh, who were loyal to me and um, shared some of the same visions that I share in terms of making a change. So without my staff, I would have never been weak. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, then when I decided not to work so hard and then my daughter came along, uh, she has helped to carry on that same kind of legacy and works very hard to make sure that we maintain the kind of focus that we've always had. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So speaking of that, what kind of advice would you give your younger self that was probably starting off or maybe maybe mid-20s, early 30s? Well, my first thing is you need to look at where your passion is, what kind of things you're interested in, and what do you need to be able to excel in that field? And not everything is a college degree, not everything is an apprenticeship program. You, so you need to look at where your passion is and I think you need to follow your passion. And I think you need to prepare yourself to be the best that you possibly can in that field. You also need to look at what are your aspirations? What do you wanna do? What kind of leadership role do you wanna be in? Or, and everybody don't wanna be in a leadership role. Some people wanna be followers and, and that's fine. But you need to look at how you prepare yourself for whatever decision you make in life. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'll take that to heart. Well, we're going to keep you with us. You know that, so. No, you're fine. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> so um, how about um, creating a gener generational wealth? Uh, what advice could you share on either passing the torch down to someone else, even if it's not family, or um, maybe even advice on... Um, business or um, improving a person's business? Well, uh, when you talk about generational wealth, I don't know much about that or how to deal with that. I think, though, you ought to be able to have someone, if you've been successful in whatever you're doing, to carry on what you've been doing. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important. And let's hope that you make a decent living out of it and that you do take care of the kids and do whatever they want to do, and you take care of other people as well, and that you do not forget from whence you came. That you always understand that it's going to be a struggle, and you got to be prepared to be that struggle. Got to be prepared for it all, huh? Yeah. Okay. Well, you kind of touched on it, but um, because there's a lot of lessons learned we can get from this discussion with you. Um, what are some of your life lessons that you would like to share? And 
It can be anything. Well, I guess the only life lesson I can share is that I've lived by that have allowed me to make some of the decisions I've made is, is that you should always keep your uh, financial resources so that you are not beholden to any job. My thing is that, you know, you always ought to have six months of money in the bank so that you have time to find another job and so that you are never in a position that you have to keep a job just because of the finance and yet you have some different ideas that want to do. It has never bothered me to tell somebody, I am leaving your job today. <laughs> 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 and be able to go and understand that my children are going to stay in college wherever they were and everything else is going to be paid on time. Mm -hmm. So uh, my thing to everybody is to be independent. You cannot do your best on any job if you're not independent. You have to be able to be independent financially. Mm -hmm. You have to be very secure in terms of uh, the area that you are working in to know that you're doing your very best job and that you have the most qualified people on that job. And if you have that, then, you know, you should be able to do whatever you think you want to do. I love it. Um, all right. Um, oh, one second. I'm going to share my screen again. But um, while well, I'm pulling this up, uh, we want to speak to Equality California. Well, I thought that was quite an honor for them to give me that award. Um, I've always worked hard with the LGBTQ community, and I think they have faced some of the same kind of obstacles that we as African Americans have faced. And it's important that we lend our hope, our support to them, and for them to lend their support to us. And aside from that, now we touched on it before, but you were honored by so many people. At, at your 91st birthday celebration, you received all these different proclamations from, uh, from BART, from SFO, even from the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. <laughs> How, how does that make you feel when you look back at what you achieved and receiving these? Did they put any money with them? No, I don't think so. They just gave me the forms. <laughs> well, that's probably just what I think about it. They didn't any money come with them. So the next day I had to get up and do the same thing I did the day before. Because that is trying to make sure that we're going to be able to pay the bills when they come in. Well, no, okay. all joking aside, you know, it feels great that people recognize what you've done. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but I didn't do it for the recognition. I did it because I thought I needed to be done. Absolutely. And if you notice, you'll find very few newspaper articles about me, very few things of that sort, because Oh, that's not why I do things. Mm -hmm. But I know one thing you can still do. What's that? You can still dance, girl. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a wonderful time, Jess. You did? Yeah. Oh, wonderful well, here you are with your daughter and your granddaughter. Oh, yeah. I mean, but great times, great celebration. Um, don't worry, we're, we're holding How's the building? Building? Yeah. Oh, and that's one of the recent projects we've included with the Allen Group. Well, that's South East. You know I was. Yeah. South Community yeah. Center. That's that's um, just a building. I love that baby. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you are truly inspiring. Um, I know you've done other things heavily involved in the community, uh, including mental health housing, charitable projects, um, the youth, uh establishing creating you know the young professional program or career path program within the allen group you know and all that we've done so i do want to show a quick video here 
And this just kind of highlights, this is one of our interns last summer put together this video, um, just kind of showing and giving you a little thank you on what the Allen Group has and continues to do. Mm -hmm. I have to jump in here and say it, it. I always get such a kick out of it because you know agencies, and I've sat in those chairs. Oh, we can't find it. Wait a minute. Yeah, we don't know where they are, and this is something that the Allen Group helps them see them. <laughs> All right. All right. All right. So with that, with that oh, we can get echo. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. So you get it. All right. So um sorry, no, we're good on time. We're great on time. We're our little interns that we have every summer we have an intern program where we go to various organizations and find young people to work with us. I guess we take about 10, 12 a summer and have lots of programs for them other than work. So they get to know the Bay Area and they learn how to network together as young people. And uh, some of our employees, we've hired from that program. So uh, that's... A great program that we do. Yeah. Mother, I wanted, um, this is Shotzi, I wanted to just add one thing to our intern program, and that is we get tremendous support from our clients in terms of, of, of assisting us with placements of interns and help to enrich their summer, you know, activities. So we're, you know, we, my mother's work over all these years has culminated into our clients being committed to bringing on more African-American, you know, uh, and people of color engineers. So I think that she kind of laid the groundwork because three years ago, it wasn't like that. And so I think that we, that together we've made a lot of inroads in providing opportunities for young engineers of color. That's all I wanted to say. Absolutely. And thank you for chiming in, Shasi. So it's good to hear from you. Uh, and Dr. Scott, we're going to turn it back over to you real quick. And then I believe okay. we're going to start answering some questions. We're going to take some Q&A questions for the next couple of minutes. Okay. Well, I, I'm going to start out with just a little few little questions, then I'll close. It. Uh, Mother, I, want, I have to ask two here, okay? One, and we've had this conversation so many times, and you spoken to it in terms of, but, you know, you talk about leadership and, you know, know a lot of smart people, know a lot of people who are really pretty, you know, they're good people, but that the thing that has really been the big ingredient is really having courage. Okay. And I guess I want to just kind of put that out there and you talk a, a, a little bit about it but it really is so critical, okay? And so if you would just, whatever reflections that you would like to 
to share on that. And you know, I might ask you about your crystal ball at the end for what's coming forward, but just to speak a little bit more about how important courage is, particularly when you do have an opportunity to uh, sit at the table, so to speak, okay? Um, I'd appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Well, Beverly, the only thing I can say about that is, you know, I don't know if you can teach people courage. I think you have to come with that. You have to come and not be so secure that you are afraid to help somebody else. You have to have a feeling for other people and want to help them and want to see them succeed. I think that that's one of the ingredients that make you a good teacher, as an example. I think I was good as a teacher because I cared about the kids and I wanted to make sure that they were going to be successful. And the same thing about a job and employment. You know, very few people would walk off in terms of a top position, uh, you know, working uh, uh, directly under the president of a college and become upset and say, I don't like what's going on and walk before the board of trustees and say, I'm leaving as of tonight. Uh, most people don't have that kind of courage. They got to plan it. They got to find another job. Uh, they have so many things that keep them there, even though they're not going to be successful. I just knew I could not be successful working under that administration. And it was time for me to go. And I made up my mind flying back from New York that that was my decision. Mm -hmm. And that's what I say about being independent so that you can help people. You can't help people grow if you are so insecure yourself. Uh, uh, security, I think, make you have courage and be able to make the right moves and the right decision. Okay, okay. And then the other thing that advice you gave earlier and it wasn't about, but that you you really have to plan. I know my dad at one point, he had worked for Small Business Administration, and he would always say he could tell who was going to be successful and who wasn't by who was wearing all their collateral or not, you know, just that you have to think yourself in terms of how you plan your life to be able to save, to make sure that you have as, as best financial positioning and everything, economic positioning, so that if when those, if and when those times come, that you that you know you need to make a different decision, that you have at least done the best you can to plan and position yourself to be able to 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 take those kinds of actions. Okay, and I'm saying, and so I, you know, just trying to prepare. You, uh, I have a, uh, one of my board members wrote a book, "Crawl Before You Ball." Okay, and I'm saying on this whole thing in terms of just being very prudent in terms of your economics. Now, here's another one that I, I have for you. And I got one more and I'm gonna leave it, go to the, the chat. One of the things that has also, you've spoken a little bit about it today too, that it has always impressed me and continues to impress me about you is that you are one of the best, it's like, how did the cow eat the cabbage? You are one of the best people I've ever seen for dissecting, I'm gonna find out who makes the decision? What is it? Like you said, I can read a contract. Who makes the decision? What is the rule? There isn't one, okay, or the whatever, that actually understands the importance of institutionalization and actually trying to put things in place that are not just about a personality. It's like, all right, this is what we need to have. It takes a law, it takes a regulation, it takes a policy, and that's what I'm going to do. And Mother, would you talk a little bit about that? Beverly, because you have, yeah. Beverly, uh, yes. I've always said one, if you're working toward bringing about change, if you can't institutionalize it, it's not worth it. You must be able to make sure that it's going to be there as something they'll try until they find something else that works even better. So I've always believed in institute, institutionalization of any changes you make. 
I know when I was at the college during the early days when everybody was marching and all the campuses were upset, my kids, well, I call them my kids, but the college students would come to me and I would say, okay, here's what we have to learn. Either I support you or I think that's foolishness, but if I support you, here's what we got to learn. We got to learn where the decision is made. And I would say to them, there are some things this president on this campus can make. There's some things the Board of Trustees can make. There's some things we can go uh, that we'll have to go to the State College Board that can make. And there's some things we've got to go to the legislature. I am always going to be clear with you where the decision can be made to bring about the change you want. I'm going to tell you whether or not I support it or not. But whether I support it or not, you are free to move forward. But I'm going to tell you where I stop my line in terms of supporting and how far I'm going to go with you. And I found that worked for me very well. I found that the students on the campus I was on when all the other campus was in uproar, my students did not go through that. And we put in all of the kind of changes everybody else was closing down campuses to put in because we looked at where the decisions could be made and how you had to go about making that decision. And they knew I was gonna be with them all the way. So uh, I think every time you make a decision to change the status quo or whatever is being operated on, you need to know what you want the end results to be, where you're gonna have to go to get that change, so that you know what steps you go about doing it and where you ultimately will end up on. Okay. Now I'm gonna bring you one from the chat and and uh uh Justin and you talked a little bit about it about uh mental health and there's a but one of the chats says you just you know thanking you so much for all your service and everything and would you talk a little bit about how have you been able to, in terms of personal balance and stress and all of that kind of stuff like that, any advice that you want to give to, you know, to our youth and to those who are listening? Well, and what course, you, know, you, don't have, you don't have enough time for me to talk about mental health. And, and of yeah. course, you know, it's no big secret. My son was schizophrenic and he ended up living at home and an honor and had many, many hospitalizations and everything. So uh, mental health has come a long ways, has a long ways to go as it relates to African-Americans. We have a long ways to go in terms of accepting it and being able to work with it and make sure that we give the, get the best treatment as we can possibly get for mental health. Uh, when I started out with my son with mental health, I always thought it was very strange. And of course, you know, I served on the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, and I served on our California State Alliance for the Mentally Ill. Uh, it was always interesting to me that the white families who had children who were mentally ill that may have been using drugs and they was always self-medicating. And all of the black families who had children that was using drugs and everything were drug addicts. And I had a hard time putting my arms around that and refused to put my arms around that. And it created a lot of confusion on the boards while I was in because I just told them they were sheer racist, uh, that that wasn't the way. I remember being on the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill and they put out their, uh, 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 TV spots for the decade of the brain. And I raised the question that I didn't see anybody look like me in the ad. And the lady told me that, well, you don't have any, uh, African-American don't have any money they're putting in this. So there was no need to put any African-Americans in the TV slots that they were putting out. Well, I thought that was absolutely very racist and I did not like that. Mm -hmm. So, we need to do more in the community. I have a group that I started about 35 years ago here in the Bay Area uh, to provide support for African-American families who have uh, mentally ill family members. 
Unfortunately, that's still going. And we uh, meet, you know, once a month and we have big programs and everything. And we do a lot of that in terms of helping families learn where services are, uh, about new medications that are coming out and how we there have psychiatrists to come in and talk about the benefit of that medication and everything. So we need more housing. We need a certain kind of housing. Unfortunately, our affordable housing and our below market rate housing does not address that population, nor does it address the special kinds of needs that housing should have for them to be successful to live in and to have some degree of independence. And we've not been able to get all of the housing for uh, to take into consideration those kind of needs. Okay, okay. Uh, Mother, here's one there. Uh, uh, Layla, one of the uh, young people here. There is not one high-speed rail system in the U U.S., but they exist in many parts of the world. From you, Why does it take so long for projects to happen in the U.S., and what do you think could be done to change it? Well, of course, you know, I believe that anytime you give something to a committee, that means that it will never work. <laughs> so if you give it to a, a committee, you might, so I think we have too many committees in this country to get anything to work. Everything has to go through a committee, which delays it. Uh, <laughs> and we have a lot of problems in terms of people being able uh, to abide by the rules, let's put it. Uh, many times, I think they're so busy trying to make sure that people of color don't participate that they lose. Can you turn my phone off? It's going off on me. Uh, they don't know what to do with that. So uh, we get too much of that going on. And mm -hmm. We don't participate. Well, my thing about the high-speed rail is if we're not going to participate in it, I don't care if we never get a high-speed rail. <laughs> That's number one. And since we have such a hard time participating, it's hard for me to be excited over high-speed rail until some of my engineers can help design high-speed rail, and some of my engineers can help decide what the passage is going to be, what the route is going to be, do the survey and help figure out until some of my people can help uh, deal with the people who are going to be impacted when you go through their community and help make sure it's understood. Just look at what happened with the freeway. When they did the freeway, they just went through Black communities and cut them off like you could not believe with no way to go from one side to the other side without going 20 miles around. Until we are going to participate fully, I really don't care if we don't get high-speed rail. Thank you very okay. much. I, I, okay, yeah, so go yeah, ahead. You go, Justin. Okay. Um, what happens when something you feel strongly about may be in conflict with your boss or client? How do you approach that type of situation? Well, I think you have to discuss it with both of them. And then finally, you have to decide and evaluate what your position is and whether or not it really makes sense. And if your position makes sense, then you have to look at your agency and figure out how best to try and get it implemented. All right. And then as a um, Black female owner, what, what kind of hurdles did you face or have to overcome, challenges you had to overcome? having enough money to be able to make the payroll <laughs> because they pay so slow. So that's the biggest hurdle that I had. But being able to make sure that my payroll was paid on time. Uh, you know, I, unfortunately, I guess it was hard for me to pinpoint if there was anything because of race or because of uh, size. Most of it was size. Uh, you had to go up against the firms that had 250 engineers and you got three. And uh, even though you, that project didn't call for 250 engineers to work on it, you still 
had a difficult time in getting that um, because you didn't have the 250. And yet you only needed one engineer for the project and at least you had three. But so that's really been the big challenge that I see that we've had. Mm -hmm. And you were able um, to move the Allen Group to graduating from the disadvantaged business enterprise and all of the those, you know, still a small business, but to really make that graduation to be able to really uh, compete well, with them. Um, worked enough with agencies to get agencies to understand mm -hmm. that uh, you didn't have to have 500 engineers to do a project to call for two engineers. And that you had to look at the two engineers that were going to be just, just be assigned to the project. And I think what they found out in the end was that when you hired me versus some big major national firm, the two engineers I brought on the project were the two you were going to have on the project. And the big national firm the two they gave you went to the next place that they were going to put in a proposal and they proposed them there. And then they substituted the two you thought you were going to have with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And I think it took us a long time to get agencies to understand that when you take a small firm, you are looking at who you're going to get. When you take a major firm, that's not necessarily who you're going to get. And Ms. Allen, I also want to mention, you have a lot of questions that are still popping up in the chat. And some people are texting me some questions as well. So maybe this is directed to you, Dr. Scott. Um, is there a way that um, we can have the questions, I guess, directed to you and then we can put them we'll together? Take, maybe Ms. We'll take a, a, a snap of the chat, okay, and then get those questions to you. We, we will post the recording. OK, and when we post the recording, we'll make sure any of the questions that were not answered here, you'll have you will have given them to us and then we'll be able to uh, add notes in the in the uh, the Zoom uh, recording piece that we do. So I think we could make that commitment because they you have really engendered, as I knew you would, um, a really good. A lot of questions, okay, and I'm saying, so we are so, so appreciative. Are there any parting comments that you would like to make, Miss Laverda, okay, and I'm saying, before we close? Well, I think the only thing I'd like to say for young people is that I'm very hopeful that you are going to carry on the things that I've been interested in and concerned about. And I think you'll be far more successful than what I've been because you'll have more support. And I want you to go where your passion leads you, be independent, be able to make the kind of decisions that you know for your profession is important. And to work hard toward achieving that and be mindful that you are stepping on, you are where you are because you're standing on other people's shoulders that made it possible for you to be considered and to be where you are. And with that, Beverly, I thank you. Oh, thank you so much. It's just been absolutely wonderful. I can't. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us. I cannot think of, a, like I said, a better person uh, to have ended this series for us. So thank you. I always think of you as being 91 years young, and I only wish I had one-tenth of the energy. Justin, thank you so much. And Isaiah, if you would put up, we've got, mm -hmm. uh, we go into our critical conversations on our next series, and that's going to be uh, the one that's coming up. And that is going to be uh, conversations throughout the month of June with young professionals and surveying on what is it about our careers that we could do more and better in terms of portraying what we do in the infrastructure sectors, particularly in this case in transportation. And then we want to candidly hear from young people, what are some of the things that you do not like 
that don't make our, our careers that attractive and your and some of your ideas in terms of what you think we need to change in order to make us be more competitive and more attractive uh, to the younger generation. So stay tuned and kicking that off will be some of the emerging leaders with the American Public Transportation Association. So thank you again, uh, Ms. Laverta Allen, Justin, the Allen Group, uh, thank you so, so much. And for all of your tremendous years of service and, and just uh, wisdom, advice, and uh, courage, we are deeply appreciative. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you. Oh, look at you getting all these claps. Wait. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, mother. Bye bye. Uh, Dr. Scott. Yes. Uh huh. Today. Who's that? Hi, this is Afia. Sorry, I, I had a meeting and couldn't get out, but I just wanted to say this was, you know, I, I wanted to be here and uh, look forward to the recording. Thank you so much oh. for what you're doing. Oh, this is a, a wonderful woman, uh, Dr. Fia Zakaya. She's down in uh, Mobile, Alabama now, and she is actually the executive director. You, you read all about the Africa town, where she is a uh, renowned water sector expert, but she is uh, taking on the, the, uh, the, the leadership of the African uh, Heritage uh, Association with uh, Africa town that's down in Mobile, Alabama. So thank you very much for, uh, for joining today, Afia. And we certainly will make sure that, uh, that, that everybody gets the Zoom. Thank you, thank you. Take care. Okay, thank you so much. All right, bye-bye. Thank bye -bye, you everyone. so much. Okay.